Yeah, the, the first thing is I'm extremely embarrassed to keep you waiting. But I have no control of my father when I'm here. And I had to talk to a big group of students. And yeah, Greg asked me to go to talk to a big group of students. I didn't expect that. Also, I did not know that there would be no projector here. So, what I have to do is to uh, read you my presentation. Okay, so that's the 
background, the next comment is that why do you want to go? And there are many reasons. One is to communicate a new important message. One is to confirm existing understanding. We know that this process has been shown somewhere on Earth, and we now know it happens where we do. As confirmation. Okay. And the final one is to improve our CVs and our career. And please understand that this is not something which is a joke. And many publications in the world are not important publications, but they're there because we need to publish to get the next grant or to get our CV uh, letter. The important reason of going through these reasons for publishing is that it helps you to identify which journal you go for. So if you've got a really exciting result, uh, which is a new finding, then obviously you go for a high-ranking journal, Nature or Science or Geophysical Research Letters, so on. So if you want to uh, confirm an existing understanding, then you come down and go to maybe journal ecology or something like that. Okay. Um, so that is leading on to the choice of the journal. What choice is a maximum impact journal, like Nature or Science? Thank you. <laughs> and uh, then you are targeting a fairly wide audience, but with a, a very specific message. And the message has to be you. And it's even better if the message is controversial. So, our understanding is this, but now we've shown that our understanding is wrong. So, that would give you a good chance of publication in the next At the next level, we have the specialist audience. So the ecological journal, uh, a pollution journal, a soil journal, and so on. So you, you would target the, uh, the specialist audiences. Then there are other journals. If we are producing a paper um, that covers a very wide subject area or crosses the boundary between disciplines. The advantage of this type of journal is that it reaches a very, very wide audience. And it shows the importance of your work, not just to people in your field, but to people in other fields. 
обращаться к исследователям не только своей области, но и к широкому спектру. И примерно хочу бы принести, принести э, следующее. Публикация Публика... 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 Ampio is called a journal of the human environment. And it's in almost every university library throughout the world. The importance of publishing there is that I want my work to have an impact on, on the welfare of people. So that's why I choose a wide range of Then the next type of journal is uh, a low-ranking but strategic journal. Um, I can't name low ranking journals because the editors will hate me. But an example of a strategy is that it, it may be good to publish in a low ranking journal um, and then make your publication widely available because it may be a faster process than going to the high ranking journal and coming down and repeating the review and rewriting the page. Как публикация журнала «Сперинский рейтинг» позволит вам публиковать свою статью значительно быстрее, нежели в журнале с гораздо более высоким рейтингом, проходя через стадии лицензирования, согласования. А ну уж на этом And strategy. Maybe try to aim high to begin with. But be prepared to come down after rejection. In British and Swedish universities, there is very big pressure to publish in high journals. Uh, no, 
статьи представляет собой сочетание... Нет, второй тип статей, это статьи, которые несут в себе синтез. И, как правило, они включают в себя метаданные, которые получены при таком синтетическом анализе различных материалов и источников. А их сценарий вы говорите? Знакомы ли вам какие-то такие статьи? Всем знакомы? Чуть-чуть Maybe I can just make a simple example. If we have the first type of paper, which is very specific, we measure plant growth on the top of the mountain and compare it with plant growth in the bottom. Okay? So here we have. So this is growth. And these are numerous, so maybe this is 10 grams. This is Mountain, and this Это is горы. That, that is a very simple type of paper we all produce. Это вот самый тип статей, которые мы все пишем. Но then it's possible to collect a thousand of these papers. And to compare them. At this time, our axes are a positive response. Zero response and negative response. And then we count the numbers of responses like this. So there are not real numbers on here. There are just relative responses. And this, is a, and this is a type of measure analysis where you can put lots of different things together. The next type of paper is a review paper, where you just look at what people have done and try to put it together, but not in an analysis, not in a formal analysis, just a word description. And then the really crazy thing is that if you make a mistake and say something bad and that's crazy, then you will get the highest citation. <laughs> because every scientist will <laughs> that he or she is very clever and tell you you've made a mistake. So they so okay. we have to create such a provocative situation. I don't recommend it. I'm not recommending, but the important, the important message is there are games. There are games to play. Хотя они рассказывают, но надо иметь в виду, что мы всегда играем в какую-то игру. Вот сейчас играет, потому 
повышать индекс цитирования. Можно в нем по-разному играть, в том числе и делая это. Вот в этом смысле. Окей, so now I want to go on to the structure of the paper. And I, I only have time today to discuss the, the, the structure of this type of paper. I don't have time to go through these other papers. But I know that I've been talking to Professor Chiamonte and together with another colleague, we hope to continue this development and now get from this event too. So hopefully we can give you more information. So let's talk about the structure of this paper. The first thing is the title. Please pay great attention to the title. There, it seems very simple. But in fact, it is the title that will be in the abstracting journals, and it is the title that has to attract interest for people to read the abstract and then the whole thing. Смотрите еще да вот такая логика. Именно заголовок первое, что привлекает внимание. Если заголовок удачный, привлекательный, у человека возникает желание посмотреть на абстракт, почитать. Если он, ему понравился абстракт, то тогда он переходит к статье. Поэтому самое важное в статье – это заголовок. Sorry, I just explained it. Thank you. And so it's very important, it must catch attention. So what I suggest to you is that you need to get a balance between a journalistic and sensationalist statements and also the basic information. So that there is a game to play again between grabbing attention like a journalist or being like a, a, a very careful scientist. You need to be in the middle. And uh, the, the, the title should be brief. <laughs> so here are examples, uh, and they're from my students and me, so uh, I can give you good examples and bad examples. This is uh, reasonable as a pure science statement. It would not grab the attention of anyone who is not in the field. Еще секундочку. Среди них есть как хорошие, так и плохие варианты. И, так сказать, очень успешные и достаточно нейтральные. И можете потом ознакомиться с ним. <laughs> this is a method section. It, 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 sorry, this is a description of methods. <laughs> so they said it has far too much information. Yeah, the one is yet slightly too much information. It's boring. It's boring. So these are other examples. Of where to attract people from other uh, disciplines. The age of the Arctic, challenges and opportunities. Возраст и Арктики – это пример журналистского использования научных возраст и Арктики вызовы и возможности. Challenges and opportunities. Вызовы и возможности в Арктике и глобальных сообществах. And the next one, the Arctic, an indication of the planet's health. So those titles are more journalistic and they attract a wider audience. 
в последние два типа они больше относятся к журналистскому подходу, к насилию на то, что привлечь внимание в истории. So it's good to have a balance between, forget that, to have a balance between this and this. Да, и вот забудьте про этот вариант, потому что так вообще нельзя поступать. А всегда нужно найти, речь идет о балансе. Баланс между чисто научным названием и броским журналистским названием. Лучше, если они будут совмещаться, сочетаться между собой. Okay, so that was a title. <laughs> the, next, the next thing that we write, uh, at the end, actually, although we come from the beginning to the end, the last thing we do in the document is to write it either a summary or an abstract. The journal format will tell you which it wants. But they are different. So, a summary presents a long list of oh, well, not long, a list of bullet points of all the content from the background why you're doing the study to the wider consequences of what you found. It is a summary of the whole thing. The contrast that is an abstract. An abstract is a single paragraph. It's not a list of bullet points or individual points. It's a single paragraph. And it gives highlights of the study. They are both extremely important by the title. Because very often abstracts and summaries appear in abstracting media. So you need a really good abstract or summary as well as title to interest people, to attract people to read your work. Они могут крайне важны, поскольку часто абстракты цитируются, приводятся в других изданиях, и вы должны привлечь внимание к своей статьи посредством удачного написания абстракта, Both should contain key messages. And I advise you and I advise my students to be a little bit propagandistic, <laughs> to use propaganda. So, if you can say something like, this is the first time that... Or this new finding shows that... This surprising finding has new light on an old problem. If you include these words or phrases in, in your abstract or summary, it will attract people. The next part of the, the document is in the introduction. It should not be too long. I recommend something like three pages of A4. It's about a thousand words. That's very short. And what it should do, it should focus, number one, you want to discuss the general area to set the context of the study and the overall problem. So, for example, if I'm writing a detailed paper on an experiment uh, to look at the impact of climate change, the opening paragraph will be about the importance of climate change. It will say things like uh, current climate warming is uh, one of the major environmental challenges to current generations. But then it will start to focus 
it, from that general statement it will go to things like, but the effects are very different from place to place. And we do not know what's happening in this place. So we've gone from a very, very general concept to quite a detailed reason for the study. It should include a very brief overview of major relevant literature. This is important, only major and only relevant literature, because if you want to put too much in there, it becomes a review paper and not focusing on your science findings. Then, as I mentioned, you have to highlight what the specific problem areas are that you will work in. And then focus on what your paper will contribute. To try to explain that, the specific problem area may be that the tree line is going up in some places, it's going down somewhere else, and we don't know what's controlling that. So that will be going from the specific problem area, and then you'll say this paper intends to investigate why you get different responses. So we're going from a specific problem to a detailed paper. Let's take a specific example. For example, we have a problem, but at the same time, it illustrates the whole process of how it works. So, you also, when you're talking about how your paper fits into the bigger problem, you need to mention the methodological approach, but extremely briefly. So, using words like, this study is based on a treatment analysis, you do not want to pull in all the huge details of exactly which treatment analysis, but you need, or this program you sat, this paper you satellite images, Something like that, just to prevent in a very, very general way how you're doing your work. Ну, например, или вы проводите какие-то эксперименты на каком-то оборудовании, или вы пользуетесь спутниковыми данными и дистанционными методами зондирования. And if it's a field study, then you need very brief details of the location. Not the temperature regime, climate regime, um, just briefly where it is, because all the other details come in into it. Если вы проводите полевое исследование в Филдстаде, то тогда вы обязательно должны еще описать место, где проводится это исследование. То есть вы не описываете подробно там температурный режим, динамику метеорологическую или еще что-то. Но во всяком случае люди должны понять, Это очень важно для такого рода статьи, именно в каком месте это происходит, и охарактеризовать основные э, черты этого места с географической точки зрения. Окей, okay, the last thing, I think, is at the end of your introduction, you want to, to specify what your the specific end of the paper is. This main aim of this paper is to find out why a tree line goes up here and goes down there. That's the end of your introduction. There is a fashion now that uh, some editors and uh, supervisors like to address hypotheses. So, for example, uh, this paper hypothesizes 
that the rise in tree line is due to climate warming, but the decrease in tree line is because of soil disturbance. Ну что, например, линия леса поднимается за счет климатического потепления, а опускается за счет истощения минеральных почвенных ресурсов. Вот пример изложения. Линия, в смысле, высота. Ну, граница леса все время перемещается как в горах, так и на равнине. Это называется фрилайн. Ну, просто на этом примере она выглядит. Может быть, какой-то эксперимент. The difference between the two is with an aim. You don't really know what the end point will be. So you're trying to find out what the end point is. With a hypothesis, you're actually predicting what you will find. And then you test that prediction. But the big problem is that uh, many people construct hypotheses after they found the results. They cheat. Нет, проблема в том, что многие люди начинают заниматься формулированием гипотез уже на основании каких-то готовых результатов, а не перед тем, как они получают какие-то результаты, а потом гипотезу тестируют и проверяют. Это не совсем правильный путь для выдвижения гипотез. Понятно, да, что? I understand why this is done because of pressure, a fashion that people want to use hypothesis, but it is dangerous. Понятно, почему люди выбирают по такому подходу. Это модно, интересно, но это можно показать. And the reason why it's dangerous is because when you got your result and then you write your hypothesis. It may be a reviewer cannot understand how on earth could you adopt this hypothesis based on current understanding. So my advice is if you have a very good reason for creating a hypothesis, do it. But if you don't have any a good reason, go to aims. Okay, the next section is the material methods. Material. Some of this is obvious. Describe sites if you are using field sites. Если вы проводите полевые исследования, филд сайт. Окей, дисплейте на филологии. Обещайте, когда вы используете исследования. Important today. Describe the statistical analysis in a separate subsection. Важно также отметить статистические исследования. Очень важно описать статистические методы как особую подсекцию. Сейчас это принято в большинстве публикаций. When I started my career, the papers were reviewed by people in the field. So if I wrote an ecological paper, it would be reviewed by the scientists. В начале карьеры, начиная с профессора Голден, а статьи регулировались, редактировались специалистами в этой же области. Например, если вы эколог, вашу статью будут регулировать логи. But there is now a long trend to employ professional statisticians to look at the statistical analysis in everything. So do describe as accurately as possible your statistical approach. Be quite brief. If you have a huge amount of material, just let, for example, you, you are doing a meta-analysis and you have <laughs> sites, and in each of these sites you want to describe their latitude and longitude and altitude. Uh, 
Don't do it in material methods, but have online supplementary material. You need to have um, a balance between providing enough information so that the validity of the approach can be evaluated. But not so much detail. That the results become invisible. And I think that was marvelous. So we don't want 10 pages of methods and one page of results. This is not a way to get an impact for your research. And I repeat, we do have many journals now with online supplementary information or material. And that is a really useful way of getting a lot of detailed information. I think the easiest part of the paper to write is the material methods and the results. But there is confusion between those papers which have a result section and those papers which have a result and discussion section combined. Choose carefully which one you want to use and don't cross over between them. So if you go for a pure results section, that section should not contain any discussion. It should not contain any methods. It should just be, we found that plants grew higher at low altitude than at high altitude. You don't want to say this means that the, the climatic conditions are better at the longitude. That's discussion. You only have to say what the graph shows. And then you go on to the next finding. But if you use results and discussion approach, then it's justified to say that plants grew better at the bottom C figure 5 because the climate was better here. So giving a, a reason behind the result is appropriate for a results and description If you use a results and discussion section, you should not introduce meth methods. You should not say, going back to this example, we looked at sites at 100 meters or 1,000 meters and we measured uh, leaf growth uh, and then we found. That's methods. That should be repeated earlier in the paper. Sorry, John. Ну, то есть, если вы взяли для себя путь сочетания результатов и дискуссий, results and discussion, да, по такому направлению идете, вы ни в коем случае не должны говорить о методах, с помощью которых вы это получили, потому что это принадлежность другого раздела. И нельзя бесконечно, так сказать, из одного раздела материалы перекидывать в другой раздел. То есть только обсуждение и сами результаты, но никаких методов в этой секции. The advice on how to choose between results, a separate discussion and combined results and discussion, that depends on if you are having different topics in your paper. If, if there is just one theme 
one type of measurement, one type of result. So, for example, it's plant growth, but different types of, of variable, biomass, leaf area, nitrogen. A result and a separate discussion would be appropriate. But if you're discussing plant growth, animal distribution, land management, then results in discussion would be appropriate because you can go through each of the topics explaining results and then explaining the importance of those results in the discussion. Тогда мне придется без конца указывать, творили ли вы одно конкретное результате, а в другом, а в третьем. Если же у вас разного рода результаты, достигнутые результаты исследования, тогда вам а, национально придерживаться подхода, который а, снизимно говорит о результатах исследования. Есть дискуссии. А мнение наоборот. Если вы изучаете какую-то одну величину, одну, ну, например, рост деревьев, то тогда вам нужно идти по пути отдельно результаты, отдельно дискуссия, потому что это удобнее. Описали результаты, потом обсудили их. Но когда один параметр используется? Если вы проводите сложное многофакторное изучение, например, и перемещение границы леса, и рост деревьев, и распределение, допустим, животных на этой территории, абсолютно разные процессы изучаете и показатели, то тогда неизбежно приходится пользоваться результатами дискуссии одновременно, потому что невозможно такие сложные системы описать по отдельности в разных параметрах. То есть, когда система простая, однофакторная, или что-то одно вы исследуете, тогда вы разделяете это. А когда система сложная, многофакторная, тогда вы это совмещаете. Понятно, да? Yeah, I said this before, the discussion is often the hardest part of the debate to write. It is really important when you start to write the discussion that you go back to your aims and hypotheses. Because the whole of the paper is to present or, or study a particular phenomenon. So if your discussion is about something else, then the introduction is irrelevant. So there is a cycle between your introduction, which sets the, uh, outlines the problem, and your discussion, which shows how you solve the problem or part of the problem. Papers are often rejected if the original aims are not addressed in the discussion, if you go off somewhere else. Although the, I said the discussion should not present your methodology, it should not outline the methods you use to explain the results. What it should do is it should critically as evaluate the methods. If you think the methods have affected your interpretation, or better methods could have been used, then you need to say that. Then to finish the um, the discussion or the discussion and um, yeah, the discussion section, there are different ways of finishing. A lot of people don't know how to finish. A lot of people finish like a very detailed point. That's not good psychology. The two ways I advise is number one is to really specify the importance of what you found. Don't finish by saying more research is necessary. 
И заканчивайте, пожалуйста, указанием на то, что необходимы дальнейшие исследования в этой области. Because logically you just made your work with other people. Потому что таким образом вы обесцениваете собственные исследования. But what you can do, if you if you are a PhD student who is producing a series of papers, and this is the first or second, and there are more to follow. Но если на самом деле должны последовать дальнейшие исследования, если вы только в начале своего исследовательского пути, then it's clever to say that this paper has solved this problem, but there is a remaining problem. That will be addressed in a future paper. В таком случае вы можете акцентировать внимание на том, что данная статья решала конкретно вот такие задачи. В дальнейшем планируется, возможно, решить еще иные. Then people will be looking for your work. И это заставит читателей следить за вашими вышедшими статьями. Another big mistake that's made is the final section, which is the conclusions. Ошибки даже могут возникать с последней части, с заключением. There are two big mistakes that people make. If you have results and discussions, or you're combining, um, then you should not. Uh, sorry, then you need a conclusion section because you need to hold these different things together. But if you have separate. Results and then a separate discussion section. The discuss separate discussion section should already have pulled things together, so it does not need a conclusion. No, no, no. 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 Вторая ошибка это когда вместо заключения вы пишете краткий обзор своей статьи. And a lot of people write a conclusion section, which is pure repetition of the summary of the paper. Многие как раз пишут заключение то, что полностью повторяет содержание самой первой части статьи. The main goal of the conclusion is to discuss the wider implications, the wider importance of the study. Основная цель заключения – указать на большую дальнейшую значимость данного исследования. Или в каких областях оно может применяться? Now I apologize to you, because that's a... Sorry, I'm not finished yet. That's as far as I got with putting my notes onto the computer. Because every few minutes I've been going to a different place. I have not been in control of my agenda while I've been here. So I apologize, this is not yet on PowerPoint. So it would please be patient with me. The next section of the paper is the acknowledgments. Be politically correct. People who have funded your study like to see their name around the world. So mention, sorry. So mention all the funding agencies. Упоминайте все фонды, которые способствовали вашему исследованию. If you have used facilities at other labs, then acknowledge those, but do not acknowledge that of your own institution. And then one big uh, possible problem is co-authorship on your paper and acknowledging contributors. So, acknowledgement should be given to people who have commented on your manuscript. But if someone has written part of the manuscript, written. 
very repeated again. Yeah. Yes. So if, someone, if, if, if someone has comments, yeah. they should be acknowledged. If someone has comments, they should be acknowledged. If someone has comments, they should be acknowledged. Yeah. If someone has какой-то отзыв пусть не прямой, а последовательный в вашем статье, каким образом принимал участие, то он даже лучше должен стать соавтором. Окей. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, that, that you have to follow the format of the jury. И последнее, о чем нужно сказать, это следующая часть это список Formatting references is something I find is a complete waste of time for But we have to do it. And my advice is to use something like N to organize your reference. Но это необходимая часть. И uh, есть специальное предложение. Есть специальное предложение, которое называется End Note, которое доступно на сайте uh, журнала Ever. Да, знакомы вам, которые занимаются индустрией инфицирования, в том числе с фокусом. В приложении доступном формате Drive можете его попробовать, называется End Note, позволяет вам оптимизировать свои временные затраты, когда вы работаете над списком цитируемой литературы в своей статье. Приложение позволяет вам очень быстро искать ресурсы, упомянутые в статье, при доступе компьютера в интернет. So EndNote is a bibliographical software. Did you explain that for us? Ah, thank you. The, the advantage of using EndNote is if you format your references in one style, send it to a journal, and the journal says, no, sorry, we're not accepting that. So you have to rewrite your paper in another style from the journal. You press the button on EndNote and you get all your references in a new style. And it can save days of work. Несравненное преимущество программы EndNote состоит в том, что когда вы свою статью подгоняете по требованиям определенного журнала, и вдруг этот журнал не принимает вашу статью, нажатие одной кнопки может сэкономить вам огромное количество времени, и программа сама переформатирует статью по требованиям нового журнала, который вы теперь хотите подать свою статью. I just want to say a few words about figures and tables. Figures and tables are to communicate and to communicate easily. Don't use very complicated figures or very complicated, very long tables. If you need that information, summarize it in a text and put the long list in online supplementary material. Okay, um, I think the, the, the last, I want to two more points. Uh, one is the main reasons for the rejection of the paper. If it's nature or science, the usual reason for rejection is not of general enough interest. It's too specific. And we recommend you to go to a more specialized journal. Journal that uh specializes on a широкom spectre. Дисциплин научных, можно вам отказать публикации, посоветовал вам обратиться к журналу, выбранному издавать статьи по данной локальной проблеме. Ну, например, Nature и Science всегда отклоняют статьи, которые не ориентированы на широкую аудиторию, а имеют узкую направленность. Они сразу пишут, пожалуйста, пришлите свою статью в журнал узкой направленности. One of the uh, reasons for rejection is the subject area is outside the scope of the journal. Uh, 
So writing a paper on the Antarctic and submitting it to an Arctic journal is not good. Another more serious, this is a simple mistake, but a more serious mistake is it's impossible to address the aims and hypotheses of the paper with the methods used. And I reject papers and also grant proposals very often on this basis. By using this methodology, you cannot possibly show what you want to show. И он да, часто, как редактор и как э, э, оценщик грантов, отклоняет э, подобные проекты. There are better statistics to use, something like that. And that's very common too. So I advise you, if you're not really good statisticians yourselves, and you have a paper depending on some good statistical analysis, bring in a statistician, a professional, and get help. <laughs> And the last topic I want to cover very briefly is the writing style. If you are not a native English speaker, get someone to check your language. But I suggest, I suggest two processes. The first process is to get someone in your field to help you to plan the structure of the paper. And check the culture of the writing. And they don't need to be perfect thinkers, they just need to know how to write a paper. And then the second, final stage is to get a translator to check the, the technical English. And then just a few tips. Be direct. Use short sentences. And use sentences which are the subject, the verb, and object. Don't have ten clauses. Don't start with the object every sentence. Чтобы сделать меньше ошибок, есть простое правило. Используйте простой порядок слов, подлежащий, сказуемое, дополнение. Не используйте много предаточных предложений, связанных на которых вы можете подвергаться. Будьте внимательны с использованием временных конструкций, с временами, которые вы используете. So, I would give you, you have to be consistent, I give you a very simple Example of how it can be misinterpreted. So, if you use the expression "it is known that," then everyone will accept that knowledge. But if you use the word "it was thought that." Но если вы говорите, что было, было установлено, вы говорите о том же знании, но один спрашивает это знание, а другой принимает это знание, просто используя тензы. Если вы пишете, что было установлено, то каждый начинает сомневаться, было ли действительно установлено, то уже эта информация не, не будет принята всеми читателями как абсолютно достоверно. So please be consistent. And then, now, please forgive me because one of my biggest problems uh, with helping <coughs> friends writing papers in English from Russia 
is that there is a culture of going into great detail on concept. Don't use this approach if you're producing a paper based on results. Sorry. Да, и используйте этого, когда вы пишете статью очень простую, которая должна показать просто результат вашего исследования. Надо там заниматься никакой философией, никакой методологией. So finally, what I would like to say is that it's another apology because of my schedule, but I will put these remaining points on this presentation. And then Sergey, if you find it useful, we'll make it available. But it will be a living document because uh, we will add to it, so we will get other specialists in other fields to add to it. Просто Терри еще говорит о том, что ему из-за того, что не мог много прийти, не дали даже завершить презентацию. Вот он передаст эти материалы, мы их напечатаем, и я думаю, что этот материал будет находиться в общем доступе. Его можно будет использовать как инструкцию, мы ее выложим на сайт. Также мы обязательно выложим на сайт видео с переводом, чтобы не только вот наша, как один из моих любимых деканов говорит, наш узкий круг ограниченных людей мог с этим познакомиться, но и более широкая аудитория. I don't know if what I've talked to you about today is helpful.